Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast. I'm your host, Rafe Kelly. At Evolve Move Play, our aim is to help you cultivate a more meaningful life and a more heroic self by reconnecting deeply to movement, mindfulness, nature, and community practices. This podcast was created to bring the best and brightest minds in all of these subjects together to better understand how we can create an empowering and sustainable ecology of practices for personal growth. If you're interested in being part of this ongoing conversation, the best way you can support us and get involved is by joining our Podcast Plus membership. By joining, you will get backstage access to our live podcast airing once a month, as well as a private question and answer session with me and our guests after the show. On top of that, you'll get access to our thriving online community where you can continue these deeper discussions with people all over the world who are just as passionate and curious about these topics as you. More details about the membership as well as the link to get signed up are in the description below. And whether you can join, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so that you can be notified every Monday when our episodes drop. Thanks so much for your support and we hope you enjoy the show. Hey guys, back this week with another episode of the Evolve Move Play podcast. My guest this week is David Farrick. David runs a website called Big Picture Soccer and he's been interacting with my content for a while and, you know, sharing some of his responses and has a lot of interesting ideas. He's associated with a kind of really interesting constellation of thinkers uh, around applying ecological dynamics to sports and studying them. So he is part of the same group of people as Dorte Arroyo and Keith Davids um, and um, some of the folks who are also studying parkour and its relationship to ecological dynamics. So obviously we have a lot in common. And after my most recent conversation with Verveke, there was some stuff around, um, around the intersection with ecological psychology that he wanted to discuss with me. And so um, we just set it up as a private conversation, but I figured I would record it in case it was really interesting and worth sharing. And as it turned out, I think it was. So it's, it's a little bit different. It's not really a formal interview. And, you know, I don't even have my, my nice camera turned on. Um, his, his camera is dark, but it's a really good conversation. We dig deeply into a lot of subjects. We, we, were, we were conversing about the stuff for, for quite a long time. And um, I just think a lot of interesting stuff came out of it. So uh, my friend Paul Vanderclay does these rando conversations for, for people who are his followers who reach out to him and, and want to have a chat. Um, and so it's, it's fun to kind of invite uh, someone from the audience in some sense to come up and share. And um, David's both someone from the audience, but also someone who has a lot of subject matter expertise that overlaps and has a lot to share. So um, yeah, I think this is going to be a really fun conversation for anybody. So without further ado, my conversation with David Farrick. From hearing your background, we actually have some differences, but a lot in common. Um, I was homeschooled. Okay. K through 12. Um, and, you know, you described like going to the library and just kind of diving into anthropology. So that, that resonated with me a lot because I was, yeah. I was kind of that kind of a kid who, you know, the librarians knew me well. Um, but then I also was like, sort of a bizarre circumstance, like lived overseas, um, was a big like wanderer and explorer. Mm -hmm. So um, that was like something I felt, I'm guessing we probably had in common, spent vast majority of time either outside or reading. So I kind of felt like just from hearing you talk, I felt like we always had that kind yeah. of similar upbringing. Yeah, I mean, being homeschooled, uh, I only did about two hours of schoolwork a day yeah <laughs> so you know didn't have any other kids around for until they got off school and i yeah. went to the dirt road so there weren't that many other kids to be involved with anyways yeah um and harder to you know meet friends without school so i spent a lot of hours alone just wandering mm -hmm. in the woods and then uh once i got into reading i was yeah uh lots of lots of reading for sure and it's a funny thing because when you are sort of in that vacuum, you don't perceive yourself like relative to a peer group. Mm -hmm. So like you have, there, I mean, it's like sort of cliche, right? Like that these kids have like some things that they're, you know, way ahead in other things that they're way behind in. <laughs> yeah. But you don't, I actually think that's probably one of the blessings of it is that you don't think of like, oh, I'm, I'm gifted in this or, or like you just like, it is what it is. Um, but 
yeah, I think having that kind of like very unstructured time, I feel like late, I'm realizing like later, I wonder how influential that is in like how I think mm-hmm. not having, it's hard to know like what I miss because I've never been to school aside yeah. from, you know, university, college. Um, but it's hard to know like how much that influenced the way that I think. Yeah, I feel like I've been grappling a lot with how my upbringing has sort of influenced the the questions that I'm focused mm-hmm. on and the things that I grapple with and the way that I react to, to things, you know? Yeah. But I did go to school. I went to school through from kindergarten through third grade. Okay. Uh, I had an experience of the of the the standard public school system, which was very yeah. traumatic for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I had I had both. <clears throat> And, uh, and then, you know, I, I mentioned a lot that I'm, I was raised in the counterculture. And mm-hmm. So that, that's, uh, that's something that I'm, I'm noticing has, has played a big role in the, the way that I think about things. And, um, it's a, it's an interesting legacy, I guess, the, the counterculture. Yeah. And it's yeah. something that I want to understand more. I think that like obviously, I, I have a, a a sense of what what it looks like and what it is, and you know how it mm-hmm. plays out. But the historical antecedents of it are not something that I know that well. Mm-hmm. And you know, I've started to um, started to kind of dig down into that a little bit and be like, okay, so you know, the 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 hippies are influenced by the nature boys in in mm-hmm. in Germany, really. And the nudist cultures that develop in Germany, which, you know, Rudolf Steiner is a huge influence on everything that comes in, mm-hmm. you know, that tracks back to, you know, Theosophy is also big, all of it's influenced by Heidegger and, you know, Heidegger's critique of, of, uh, of technological society and how mm-hmm. it kind of, um, shifts our mental frames. There's, I mean, obviously, and just romanticism in general is, yeah. You know, as a philosophical tradition is incredibly deeply interwoven into everything that counterculture became. Yeah. So there's sort of, I'm sure like a big American spin on all of that as well. Yeah. I mean, that's harder for me to see, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. embedded within American, within um, America. So like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've been all, well, over there, but yeah, but it's still like, you know, but America is so, America has colonized the rest of the world so much. You know what I mean? Right. Like if you speak with a standard American accent and you you like you just think you don't have an accent. Yeah. Yeah. And you can find people everywhere almost who have elements of your accent, you know? Right. And so it's 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 sort of the same thing. It's like you don't think about McDonald's as as like America, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's funny because like the cliche is Americans maybe are ignorant of the rest of the world, which I think is often true. But I found like being overseas, people ha- have a pretty low resolution image of the U.S. Oh, like, yeah. I think particularly Europeans don't know how big it is. Mm-hmm. They just don't really have anything to compare it to. Yeah. To think about like the distance, you know, from you on the West Coast to me and how how many different subcultures there are in between or how few compared to Europe. Like, I mean, yeah. there's, there's obviously differences, but like, you know, I, you're trying to explain the scale and like the difference between Europe and, um, and, uh, and the U S to people like, mm-hmm. I'll explain that like the standard American dialect is the dominant dialect from basically Minneapolis to the West coast. And from Canada to the Mexican border, I mean, there's small variations, mm-hmm. but it's pretty much like you can you can expect to 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 speak to people who have those accents, and that's kind of like going from London to St. Petersburg, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and from you know Edinburgh to uh, to Morocco, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's an extraordinarily vast area in which there is kind of one 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 dialect uh linguistically but also i think that that there's a kind of um common 
you know, what, what uh, Jordan Hall might call blue church culture uh-huh. that you see in every town in America, uh, not maybe not every town in America, but every major city in America has at least some people who are kind of part of that, right. that general cultural package. And it's also, I feel like colonized other countries to a degree that they're not necessarily aware of. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. How'd you get, um, how'd you get involved with John Bakey's work? Yeah. So, um, I saw Jordan Peterson on, um, on Joe Rogan in Mm -hmm. fall of 2016 and became obsessed with his stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, I kept meaning to like invite him on my podcast and didn't, I just wanted to read everything that he'd written and like get all the way in basically before I did it. Then, uh, I went to an event that he had here in, in, um, down in Seattle and, uh, invited him on my podcast and he said, yes, but then it didn't happen. Right. Right. So then he, uh, for, for a variety of reasons, like I was actually going to go out to Toronto to, to film it. And, um, my wife was pregnant and the only dates that they had were like too close to her mm-hmm. delivery date. And then <clears throat> the next year January was the release of his book and the Kathy Newman interview. And then, you know, yeah. he went straight oh, wow. right. So when John came around, like it was, it was Jordan who, who I saw a tweet from Jordan about John series. Mm-hmm. So I, I started listening to John series. I was like, okay, this is, this is the next kind of thing mm-hmm. in this mm-hmm. world of exploration that I've been, that I've been doing. And after, you know, after I'd caught up to where the series was, I was like, I'm not mm-hmm. waiting to contact this guy because you know, he might go stratospheric too. And I need to, right. I need to get in while the getting is good. Cause what I was told is that like, you know, Peterson basically said yes to everybody in those first sort of six or seven months. Mm-hmm. And he was very interested in everyone who was interested in his work. Mm-hmm. And then he just got too big. Um, yeah. I was like, okay, cool. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to let that, that opportunity slide now that John is on the, on the table. And I'd heard about John too, because, you know, there was this other guy, right? Like it was Jordan and John were the two most life-changing professors um, at U of T. And I'd heard about that before John kind of started putting his new series on. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I need to, I need to talk to him. So yeah, so I was, uh, I just reached out and we had a chat and I, uh, I worked my ass off to have that chat with him because like, I really want to be prepared. So like I went, and, yeah. you know, uh, I'm trying to remember if it was the first or second time that I read a bunch of his actual scientific literature, mm-hmm. but I, I went really deep into it and I, you know, I was consuming hours of his content in preparation for the interview. And mm-hmm. like, I, I couldn't, I didn't know how to structure the interview, what I was trying to do until like the day of, and I like went and lay down in my garden for a couple of hours just to like let it all gestate. And then, mm-hmm. Boom. And then the interview went really well. And John just told me he wanted to keep staying in touch and keep chatting. And um, so he suggested that we kind of touch base every month or so. And we've Mm -hmm. been doing that ever since. I think I actually had almost the reverse. I think I saw some of John's academic stuff, the flow paper. Yeah. I think maybe even, I think his reply to Lakoff and Johnson. I saw some of that stuff first. Mm -hmm. And then I saw maybe a few of his, early early lectures yeah and then i think i didn't see anything of it for a while or just forgot and then i was like what is this awakening for the meaning crisis thing and i got into that and was like binged it hard i think it was probably almost halfway through at the time and i just i binged like the first half and then i was just like tweaking every friday (laughs) (laughs) so yeah yeah, i mean he's excellent yeah, I mean, he basically wrote his book, right? Mm-hmm. I, I saw something interesting about like why you should read books. I think it was like Stephen Kotler was writing about why you should read books, and he was like, you know, um, like a tweet compresses this much time, right? It's like mm-hmm. this. Like I've been thinking about the stuff that I tweet for this long, right? And mm-hmm. then a blog post is like, uh, you know, maybe twenty hours of my life, you know, mm-hmm. that, that are compressed into that, and then like. A paragraph in a book is hundreds of hours, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, so, like, I think Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, like, a good way to think about it is that it's it's like a serialization of a book presented as a lecture. Right. And it represents decades, probably. Exactly. I mean, you could tell. 
you could see towards the middle i happen to have a, like on the technical side i had the background i had some of the i've read a decent amount of like heidegger Kant, but there were some things that i wasn't familiar with i think i probably had pretty good background literature yeah. but you could see like if you hadn't it got pretty you could see from the comments it was like people were struggling a little bit yeah i need to go back to it um i look forward to when the books uh, comes out like I, yeah. I, nice to have like a a text-based resource where i can you know earmark things and highlight things and you know know which page it's on to go back to and not have to mm -hmm. sort of um scrub through to try and find mm -hmm. it i've been trying to scrub through uh jordan peterson's uh, uh, maps of meaning series to find the point mm -hmm. where he talks mm -hmm. about jj gibson i actually found it in order to send it to Urveki. Um, uh -huh. because he was like was saying that he didn't think that he'd seen jordan like properly credit gibson i was like no 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 he talks about him really directly um and then, so i found it but i can't figure I out i think where it's it. the one that he is speaking if i remember correctly i think he's actually speaking about carl rogers and phenomenology is he is, is, it, that, is it? or is that in the that might be in the personality series per, Carl, Carl i remember Rogers that in personality he might speak about it but i know he speaks about it briefly i was like he gave like a brief snippet um yeah. i don't remember him getting that deeply into it but like he mentioned it i, I do recall that so I, i've been kind of going back through maps of meaning um mm -hmm. You know, not listening to all of it, but like kind of scrubbing through it, skimming it, um, listening to it at a high speed. And I've gotten to uh, Maps of Meaning 5, and it mm -hmm. sure sounds like he's about to introduce these ideas. Okay. I think they're going to be introduced in the sixth lecture of the series. That's my guess, but I need, okay. to, I need to go back and, and, and get that done. So, What's the... Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, um, yeah. Any, anyways, the, the point was it'll it'll be nice, but uh, but yeah, I've been I've been doing maps of meaning now. Uh, I've been rereading it and sort of like taking time to digest it and like be critical about some of the claims mm -hmm. in a way that I mm -hmm. you know it was just too overwhelming to really be critical of them in the meaning. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of like you got to absorb absorb this. Right. Um, but like, okay, cool. Well, what do I think about this? How do I compare it to other things? Like, you know, how solid is this claim on this page versus the next claim? Mm -hmm. I've been going back through that and um, that's been pretty rewarding. And so the probably maps of meaning will be, will be next on the, the review agenda, but it'd be really nice if there was the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your familiarity like with Gibson or how'd you get involved with that? I know I've heard yeah. you mentioned Bernstein quite a lot, obviously in your yeah. movement practice. Yeah. So, well, the first time I heard about Gibson was in that Jordan Peterson lecture that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then John men uh, mentions him as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I've talked to John about him and John is, you know, John's one degree of separation academically from Gibson. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. One of his main, uh, main mentors was, was Gibson's mentor, but I haven't read Gibson directly yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, Gibson's book, a big, big book, right? Is the ecological, eco, ecological view of, um, Approach to visual perception, visual perception. Yeah. So I haven't read that one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I encountered, you know, you probably heard me tell the story, but like I started doing kind of ecological dynamics, constraint led sort of mm -hmm. teaching, uh, or, organically, it came out of the yeah. intersection of what was happening in the parkour community. And then having been a gymnastics coach and then a parkour coach primarily operating in an indoor facility that we designed mm -hmm. taking people and training them in nature and there mm -hmm. was there was a kind of um a, a, a moment where the constraint led idea kind of revealed itself to me through the practice and then i went mm -hmm. with it um and then it was one of my students michael tankovich who pointed me in the direction of the ecological dynamics approach. He asked me if that's mm -hmm. what I was doing. And I was mm -hmm. like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So he actually turned me on to Franz Bosch. So my first kind of dip into some of these ideas was with Bosch. And my understanding is Bosch is kind of his own little world in this area. Um, but I got a lot out of that. Um, mm -hmm. There's a ton of, of interesting stuff in, in Bosch. And, then, um, and then, then I went through all of Rob Gray's podcasts 
He's perception good, yeah. action podcast. Um, so that's where I, I really kind of like dug into it. Also, my friend Todd Hargrove wrote some stuff on on it. Um, Todd Hargrove okay. from Better Movement. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And so I that helped that. me kind of yeah. grounded in the ideas. And then like I was sort of digesting things slowly, but putting them into practice mm-hmm. the whole time. And I think that's that's part of what has sort of shaped my ability to to be insightful when I'm really really not mm-hmm. that well read in this area. Mm-hmm is that I'm, I'm, I'm a practitioner who's using it. Right. Well, I think that's a lot of the way a lot of people came into it. I had a similar thing I was coaching and I was trying to figure out like in a dyadic interaction, regardless of the sport, I was like, how the hell does causality work? <laughs> Cause I was like, wait, am I doing this because you're doing that? Or are you doing that because I'm doing this? And then I, I like fried my brain real quick. And I was like, wait, this can't work with a sort of efficient cause. Like it's not, it's like, there's no way you could consider one thing individually. Mm-hmm. Um, so then trying to, somehow I, somehow I picked up someone talking about constraints. Yeah. Um, and then I, I got deep into Gibson from there, but I've heard that from like a lot of people um, that it was like, they sort of had an intuition about things that are complex, especially, you know, interactive things, not being that accessible or efficiently interacted with via like explicit instruction or more, um, you know, verbal do this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but people having experiences of like seeing like sort of rapid shifts, like in kind of the movement landscape from things like that kind of emerge, you know, and then you kind of see it and you're like, wait, how did that happen? And I think the people who have sort of a tendency to be observant have developed kind of like a intuitive feel for that. Cause I've heard that from a lot of coaches who've gone into this are like, Oh, I was doing this and then I found later like a yeah. more the form, formal framework. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's, I mean, play is basically right. it, right. Um, mm-hmm. And, and you can see that, that people learn and develop through mm-hmm. play. I mean, I mean, I was looking at play research for a long time before I came into this stuff, mm-hmm. right, into the, the ecological dynamic stuff. So that was influencing my, my approach. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know like I I mentioned I don't know if you saw my presentation for the the sport movement conference but I was talking about the fact that like American wrestling has Mm -hmm. used a lot of these pedagogical principles really for a Mm -hmm. long time like if you compare American wrestling um, the good schools of American wrestling to a lot of the you know traditional martial arts in other areas like Mm -hmm it's, it's so much more constraint oriented, right? It's dozens of games, mm-hmm. live drills that are built around, you know, building situational awareness mm-hmm. and attunement for mm-hmm. specific, you know, task parameters that might arise within an actual match. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like Sean Mishka sort of wrote up that a beautiful thing about how like, you know, if you just play the game, you know, maybe this situation occurs Mm -hmm. three times a season, right? So you need to play a version of the game that makes that situation arise more frequently so that you can be prepared because it has, it's high leverage once it does happen. Um, And that's basically what, but uh, what the good American wrestlers have been doing. I mean, I I imagine forever, right? Yeah. (laughs) One of the ways that that I describe it to people is like, it would be like if you were in, you know, like an elementary math class and the, the teacher was just like, this is a number four and you're going to write the number four a hundred times and we're going to hope it comes up on the test. <laughs> you know, and then even if it does come up, you know, it's like maybe the teachers looked at the test and they know that four is a common answer, right? It emerges commonly. So you may get some success just from sort of a rote learning, writing for all the time, but, you know, in sort of like a a Chinese room experiment way, like, do they really know 
why? Yeah, um, <laughs> I still like that. I think, I think that's a great analogy. It just strikes me like I'm imagining that people writing math caught it. So yeah. you, you write out a series of equations and you you copy them down with the answer at the end by rote, but you you actually don't know what the meaning of the equations are. You're not being yeah. taught to solve new equations. That's that's sort of to me what what kata is relative to to actual like problem solving. Yeah, work. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's it is quite similar. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a beautiful analogy. Yeah, but I think like what you were saying also with play. Um, in terms of like things emerging it's tim ingle's work if you haven't gotten into it would be really relevant um because he he has like a whole concept that he's you know developed based on the backs of other work um he talks about making mm -hmm. um but he goes back to uh ingle's dialectics of nature and he's saying you know so obviously industrial era and as in Marx, they, and Engels. Marx and Engels, right? And they're obviously trying to figure out, you know, some theory of production. And, um, you know, as I'm sure almost anyone in that kind of industrial era probably would have agreed, what they felt set apart human production was that it was the actualization of something that had come in advance. So some sort of a ideal, um, you know, we're making pair of pants um but the pair of pants already exists all we are doing is sort of filling out you know the blueprint the mental model the um the ideal form of it that pre-exists yeah. so then you know they obviously put that into a dialectic with consumption and you know they bring in that whole thing but what engel does is he he goes back and he says well hold on, where does the image come from? You've got a sort of a chicken or egg thing, but where does the image come from originally if you're going to posit that being primary and then the production of that coming afterwards? So, so Ingle is like, we somehow got to the point that we imagine things so being sorry. always okay. already made, but we're just sort of going back and filling it this in. Is Ingold or Ingles you're talking about now? Uh, Oh, this is Tim. In so Ingold is the one who's he's sort of criticizing this, right? So he's saying, you know, for something to emerge, it has to have come before a plan. You know, but the received view is that the plan comes first. And that then, you know, it's whatever you do in terms of movement, action, um, you know, whether that be, I mean, obviously it's influential in sport with sort of like um, expert model of technique, um, you know, and you're converging onto that or game plan and team sports, right? Um, it's all going back to this idea that what makes humans different is that we lay down our plans first and then we just sort of actualize them. Yeah. But there's a certain spontaneity that's lost and obviously it's logically inconsistent because where does it come from originally yeah i mean i'm not i'm not familiar with that but like what comes up for me is well first of all i think we keep finding that the antecedents of of human behavior go further back into animals than we realize right like mm -hmm. you know if a crow picks up a snail and realizes it can't get at the snail and it then flies up into the air and drops it is mm -hmm. it imagining that once it drops it that the snail mm -hmm. shell will be broken so it's creating a plan right it, is that intentional conscious behavior i think i think that um i think that might that's probably the most plausible answer actually and that consciousness mm -hmm. arises as a tool to be able to do things like that mm -hmm. right? to uh to sort between potential motor pathways mm -hmm. i think about um you know verveki talks about the idea of the imaginal right mm -hmm. the imaginal is this ability to to project you know something forward into mm -hmm. the in the in the mental space um so that models reality in some way right and mm -hmm. so we're 
just like, you know, you can imagine that we, we physically tinker with things, right? A lot of invention actually happens with tinkering, you know, with yeah. exploratory behavior of mm -hmm. the, of the physical qualities, right? Or physical capacities of a, of a set of systems or set of objects, right? Mm -hmm. This is like one of the things that Taleb talks about is he thinks that a lot more of a lot more. I mean, he actually credits all of technological development to this, which I think is ridiculous. But but his his claim is essentially that um, that that science, that theory, is all post facto. That all that the actual development comes to be a tinkering, hmm. right? So you you have some somebody you know messing around with some something you know physically, mm -hmm. and he discovers a new relationship potential between those. And that becomes a wheel or that mm -hmm. becomes, a, you know, a steam engine or whatever it is. And it's like you, you accumulate, you accumulate these, these, these cultural pieces over time that arise mm -hmm. via tinkering. And then the cultural animal has maybe developed a, an innate drive to tinker because this sort of playful behavior keeps generating potentially adaptive solutions that then are mm -hmm. adopted mm -hmm. and and spread widely um so so we have this capacity as human beings and i think i think it's it's there in in corvids and in chimpanzees and in other species as well but never never to the same degree right mm -hmm. um to uh kind of imagine a motor action before we do it right mm -hmm. So then we can create a plan. We can create a, a set of motor actions that we're doing. Um, so, you know, I guess where, where's your, where, what comes first? The first the capacity to move comes first, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, how do you choose which way to move? Well, one way, right. to choose which way to move is to develop the capacity to s essentially run simulations mm -hmm. in a, in a mental space. Mm -hmm. there's another peterson argument right like um a mosquito makes a thousand offspring and almost all of them die so the darwinian mm -hmm. process is is happening to the individuals right yeah and and then he you know quotes a whitehead who says uh you know your thoughts may your you you think so your thoughts may die and you don't have to yeah yeah uh, so we yeah, we have we have this capacity to essentially run darwinian processes in our mind so if you get to angles and the plan well the plan is essentially the production mm -hmm. the way that i would think about it and tell me if i'm you know if i'm missing something here is that the plan is actually is actually something that emerges from tons of exploratory behavior that's happened before right? Mm -hmm. All of this cultural heritage, right? And then this active tinkering and imagination, mm -hmm. then, then a plan is, is, is possible. Mm -hmm. Then it can be implemented in the world. And then that becomes grounds, right? Once, once you see that, you know, once you see that the Euro step worked for some athlete, maybe I think it was, it was Manu Ginobili who really introduced the Euro step in, uh, mm -hmm in the NBA. Okay. So, well, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. Right. He, he tinkered with things. I mean, actually, I think James Harden is a really beautiful example of this. Where does James Harden get all these things? He's tinkering, right? Right. He's thinking, what is the rule set? How do I take advantage of the rule set? How can I get more movement without having to dribble without officially breaking the rules? Mm -hmm. And then he goes in and tinkers with different moves sees what happens, sees what kind of advantages they get. And then he has a plan, right? This is the new, the new, the new James Harden step back. And then, then Luka Doncic watches it as he's growing up and he comes into yeah. the NBA and he's doing a, a step back and, you know, Michael Jordan develops his fadeaway in a way that nobody else had. And everybody comes in and, 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 and now everyone has, not everyone, but like how many players are relying on that same fadeaway going down to the low post, right? Yeah. Are you familiar with Stuart Kaufman at all? No. Okay. Um, he's kind of like a, I guess a theoretical biologist, but yeah. he just talks a lot about this concept of acceptation, yeah. um, where, yeah. right, you're probably familiar with that. I think that's from Gold, actually. Talk about, 
I'm not sure who created that idea, but that's a big idea. I mean, obviously, like I talk about it all the time. Like, yeah, why does a human shoulder have the capacity to throw? Right, like the human yeah. superpower. It's it's funny. I feel like not enough people talk about this, but like everyone everyone knows this idea that we're born to run. Yeah, but human beings are human beings are exceptional exceptionally capable runners in a very narrow constraint set yeah the ground has to be relatively um relatively hard right mm. and so basically you're looking at arid environments you have to you have to be able to sweat so humid environments don't work mm -hmm. right it can't be really too cold or else your ability to to thermoregulate better through sweat doesn't you know doesn't have the same impact on animals so it's like mm -hmm. In a very specific set of environments, human beings can persistence hunt and, mm -hmm. and kill uh, large ungulates through persistence hunting. But like canids, right, will just crush us in running in yeah. almost every other environment. Yeah. Right? Try to keep up with the dog. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. But but like a chimpanzee can can throw maybe 25 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, mm -hmm. like a healthy you know, adult human who's not trained can hit 50, mm -hmm. you know, really highly adapted humans can do 90 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. but not only that, we can throw accurately and we can throw mm -hmm. accurately at moving targets, which nothing else can. Right. I mean, this is yeah. a third superpower. It made us into the most powerful predator on earth. We've, we've taken the range at which we can kill something. Yeah. Right. With an atlatl, you're taking your range out to like 300 feet. Yeah. And now you're, you know, this skinny, weak, soft creature mm -hmm. can can out out compete every predator on earth at mm -hmm. effectiveness in killing something. So that's that's our superpower. But we couldn't have done that except for that we went through an extended period as brachiating animals. Brachiation mm -hmm. pre-adapts the shoulder for mm -hmm. throwing. So we we've exapted the 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 structure that we developed for brachiation. Mm -hmm as as a, as a throwing shoulder the tongue doesn't develop to speak it develops to right. root around them and so it's, you know it's it's we're rife with exaptation yeah yeah but i think that's sort of a point maybe in regards to like tinkering or play or exploration it's like a lot of times the thing that's most relevant for the breakthrough or what have you only takes on meaning within the new paradigm so it's only retroactive. Yeah. You know, once, like, I think even the Fosbury flop, there was some sort of an odd happenstance where there happened to be like a different kind of a mat there or something. I forget the exact story, but it was quite like, it was quite contingent. Yeah. Then, I mean, I think it was just the mat was added because if you go yeah. back to, if you go back to like 1930s Olympics and you watch them do it, it's, they they're landing in a in a sand pit that's the same height as their takeoff. Yeah, and the Fosbury flop wouldn't really work. I mean, you'd have to con you'd have to complete the somersault in order to make it work in that yeah. matter, which is possible, but I don't know if you'd have the same advantage. Yeah, you'd have to initiate your tuck earlier. Yeah, like if you watch people Fosbury flop, they usually land on their head and shoulders, and they're like basically bounce over to their mm -hmm. feet in a. Uh, in it, you know, so they've completed a, a back, a, a full mm -hmm. back rotation by the time they sort of finish the movement, but they have to land on their head and shoulders on the mat. Mm -hmm. To get all the way around to the feet using the same movement, I think you'd have to initiate the tuck earlier, which would right. make your hip height travel over the bar substantially right. lower. That makes sense. So yeah, so it's, I think it's completely contingent on the new constraints that were put there. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's a question, then, you know, for people who are in movement practice, like, how do you prepare for something that doesn't maybe yet have meaning in the sense of what's known? But yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's the role of play, right? right? The role of right. play is, is essentially creating people who are robust movement problem solvers, um, and can create novel solutions. Mm -hmm. Like, I, have you read Stuart Brown's book, Play? I have not. You know, I'd have to, I, I, it'd be good to go back and sort of like 
look at some of this research. But one of the things, you know, one of the theories of play was it's just rehearsal of sort of motor patterns that we use, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, from an ecological perspective, that that makes less sense. But from a schema perspective, you know, like we'll go with mm -hmm. that for a second. So what they found is that if you take a um, a cat who's never been allowed to play, at least mm -hmm. this works with cats, and you, um, at least the research he was talking about, the, they didn't have any sort of errors in their stalk and pounce procedure, right? Mm -hmm. If you put if you put a mouse in with that cat, it will stalk and pounce, right? Mm -hmm. And it won't look any different than an animal that that didn't that that got access to play. Mm -hmm. So this fundamental behavior is is hardwired in is what it looks like. Um, what the animal can't do is adapt to new circumstances very well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. play seems to be at least um, many animals, primarily basically a tool for the production of behavioral flexibility. Mm -hmm. And it's very associated with behavioral flexibility. Animals that are more, um, that are more behaviorally flexible play more and have longer and more extended um, juvenile periods. Mm -hmm. And what, what that's making me think of is like, there's sort of a distinction between like prospective control versus predictive control. I don't know if you've heard people use those two. That term. If you could break that up, that'd be good. Yeah, so um, it's sort of a technical distinction, I suppose, where predictive control would be like a lot of stuff like Bayesian inference, mm -hmm. um, sort of like predictive processing, kind of like what comes next, yeah. right? Um, that's obviously big, like in cognitive science. Yeah. But then the other way of going about it is what they call prospective control, um, which would be more the ecological model where the what appears to be prediction isn't a function of an onboard model of the future. What it is is basically it gets a little odd because it goes all the way back to a kind of philosophy of time um, where the idea of like what, what the present moment is starts to fall apart a little bit, right? Because, I mean, it's already, if it's greater than zero, then it already contains within it a past and a present and a future. Yeah. So, I mean, William James figured that out. Um, I'm sure someone else did before. But Gibson takes that and he says, well, what's comprising then what feels experientially as the present moment is the organism's attunement to the relative information for action. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you aren't, um, you aren't sort of predicting, you're coupling to information within the environment that specifies via like your what they call effectivities or your organismic dispositions for action right um what your affordances are right that's specified by the information that's carried within you know the way the light bounces off of the mouse as it's running away or whatever it is yeah. um so based on how well attuned the organism is to that it sort of can extend you know, there's a flexibility then to what that present moment is. Mm -hmm. So then they would say like perception is inherently prospective, like looking forward and retrospective already. Yeah. So if you accept that, then you say, well, how far can it go? Because like think about it when they talk about, you know, these working memory stuff and it's like, well, at what point does perception become memory? It's a fuzzy question. Yeah, because to think about that, you have to step outside time, define a static present and then say, well, if you move backwards, such and such amount, you know, or this many, you know, numbers or objects or whatever it may be, um, you know, then that becomes short term memory, then that becomes long term. But if you accept that, like perception, the distinction between perception as you know, generally considered present, memory being generally considered retrospective, right? Looking back 
and anticipation generally considered to be a prediction of something that's not yet there. Well, like the lines between those is already fuzzy. So you can just extend perception and say perception can expand, you know, already as a present moment, you know, that's sort of the idea of as a razor's edge kind of blows apart. So then how I'm looking at it in my work is like that what a lot of times appears to be prediction is actually a different level of attunement that affords that performer or organism a type of perception that from maybe from a different perspective looks like it's going into the future. Let's, let's look at an example. So if you are, if you have a atlatl and a spear mm -hmm. and you're watching a deer and it's crossing your, your visual plane horizontally, mm -hmm. right? And you need to throw at it. And the place that you're currently seeing it is not the place where the spear needs to go. Mm -hmm. So there's specifying information in the environment that tells you where that animal is mm -hmm. G or, or potentially tells you where that animal is going to show up in the time interval it takes for the spear to land, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, or, you know, if you're a, you know, a quarterback, right? right. And you have a wide receiver who's crossing the field, you know, in a uh, in a route. You know, you're doing the same thing. You're you're looking at that gap closing and seeing mm -hmm. where you throw to, so that the, the athlete arrives at the right time. So, what if you if you view that as as attunement to a perceptual field that that lengthens across that period of time mm -hmm. versus predicting a future state of mm -hmm. of the position mm -hmm. what does that what does that change so this is actually i don't know if you've ever seen that the outfielder problem studies uh i've i've, I've listened to rob gray break it down right talks about it a little bit yeah. but you can break the it down the reason why they basically came out with this was like First of all, you end up seeing what we call movement reversals, where if you're tracking a fly ball or some type of a flying projectile, right? Yeah. You see people kind of, right? They, where they, they don't just sort of say it's landing there and go there. Mm -hmm. What they seem to be doing is something that's involving like these little movement reversals. Yeah. So there, there's so also perception happening the whole time. Right. And the on, so they're saying, well, what, what in that case is the strategy? You say, well, if you keep the focus of expansion of the ball, the way it expands in your visual field centered, you know, so it's not expanding this way and it's not expanding this way, right? That specifies that the ball is going to come to you. Mm -hmm. So that if you look at and you, they can predict, you know, based on what well, if they were using a predictive you know, forward prediction model, how would they move? If they were using this information, then how do they move? So that's what it looks like empirically in the research is that people use those, like say driving a car, right? All you do, you don't think I'm driving 70 and this guy's driving 68 difference this much, you know, all you do is say, is this guy getting bigger or staying the same or getting smaller, right? Yeah. There's a simple coupling. So that makes sense to me when you're talking about tracking a moving object to meet the moving object. Mm -hmm. But when you're throwing, mm -hmm. there's a point at which you release the, the object mm -hmm. and then there's an interval of time in which the situation will change in which you're no longer able to gain new information. You're no longer able to couple yourself to the information that will specify whether the throw will have been successful. Right. So this is the part where it gets interesting is because the implication of that is that your perception, uh, and this is where I think this is a real strength of the ecological model, your perception, you're about to throw this spear and you're watching the thing run. Classic cognitive science would say, you've got the perception and then you've got to sort of calculate, well, how, 
what's my throwing ability like? Hmm. But what the ecological model is saying is that your perception is already built in with your effectivities or your essentially capabilities in this case, kind of to simplify, right? So you're already looking at this thing with what does the movement of this thing mean for an organism who throws the way that I do? Sure. So learning is essentially sort of coupling that together, mm -hmm. but, you know, and you can be less well attuned, obviously. Um, yeah. But it's not in the moment so much, at least according to ecological model, it's not so much a, um, cause what happens is as you tune to this, this relational, or what we'd say like a, a higher order informational, information variable you get sort of the motor control for free um so like here's what here's what i'm thinking about it, right you you want to cross a river right cognitive science is typically thought that what you must perceive is a lower order uh feature of information based off of kind of like physics like oh the water is running at this many cubic meters per second, right? And then I've got to translate, well, if I can withstand such and such pounds per square inch, then does that afford me to walk through this river? Mm -hmm. But actually, all that you have to do is put your foot in and you already feel directly how that relationship of the pressure of the water relates to your strength, balance, whatever it may be. Yeah. So the, the idea is that your perceptual system is already attuned to your, the type of organism that you are and the effectivities or abilities that you have. Mm -hmm. So that actually is a, it's a relational property. So it's higher order. So, you know, the, the animal is running and you're looking at it run, you're holding the spear, you, you know, you're hefting the spear and you're feeling that. And you're perceiving that already with relation to your ability to throw. It's not like that is actually primary. And then what if the calculation of that is almost something that we have to do backwards. Does that make sense? I don't know if I explained that very well. I don't think it, it gets, it doesn't help me understand the, the difference between perspective and, 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 and predictive here, right? Because, um, it still seems to me that you're you're talking about you're talking about imagining a future state once you release that spear, right? That in order to do that, there has to be uh, a future state that that exists, right? Like obviously, you you still have to tune. You know, you have to attune perception to to effectivities. You have to attune. You have to get all that onboard control, but. Once the spear is released, you're no longer picking up information and something mm -hmm. allowed you to release it such that it will be coupled to the environment as it will continue to, to, to play out. And, and this is something that's unique to a human being, or at least that's what the research that I've shown has seen is that, um, is that that capacity to do that, to, to couple to a, a situation as it's unfolding over, mm -hmm. uh, sufficiently far out period of time doesn't appear to be something that other animals that throw can do. Mm -hmm. No, the throwing is definitely unique. I agree on that. I think I, Rob Gray will explain it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll probably just, if you want, I mean, if you're interested, I can link that to you. I think he has a, I think he has a, one of his videos on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, obviously you can take it or leave it, um, sure. but I'm sort of using that because for me, Kind of the holy grail for me is like the time dilation element of performance or flow states or whatever yeah um which is a very difficult thing to parse sort of from a standard kind of perspective um so you have the the experiment that they did was because everyone says right if you're in a car accident time slows down that's just yeah. like i mean it's it's ubiquitous like everyone almost mm -hmm. says that um but they did this experiment where they dropped people, I think it was like 30 meters into a net. And they had a sort of a thing where they had established, okay, people can read this uh, flashing number at a certain speed. Yeah. So if time really dilates, um, 
they would be able to read it at a slightly faster rate while they're falling through the air, right? That was the, the logic of the experiment. And it comes out that they can't, or it's, you know, inconclusive, marginal. There's not really any advantage in perception. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I, my understanding is that, my understanding of it, and tell me if, if I've, I've oversimplified this, is basically that when, when we, that the best model we have is more that in extremely, in extreme situations, we capture more information Mm-hmm. per sort of sect of you know section of time mm-hmm. um so that when we look back it feels like time is dilated because the right. amount of information that that has been packed into that period of time is um is so much more right there's just so much more that's relevant that has happened in that period of time that is relevant that happens in a similar period of time when you're say you know if you're driving and and nothing bad is going on most of the information that is that the organism could perceptually pick up is irrelevant mm-hmm. right right once, so that's sort of once the, a car accident start uh starts sort of everything becomes highly relevant right potentially right and what so that's kind of what they came out with it from experiments they're like well it must be um retrospective right that yeah. you, your memory look feels that way looking back but you didn't actually gain anything in the moment but my sort of critique of that is saying well looking at a watch on your hand while you're falling has no relevance yeah it's, it's analogous to being in a car accident and then asking someone what the license plate of the car was mm-hmm. because you know and maybe that ties a little bit to john's work on relevance but those factors not relevant and from an ecological perspective, we say, well, what's relevant? The relevant factor is what specifies affordance for action. So mm-hmm. if I'm falling through the air, you know, I mean, beyond a certain height, I'm probably just basically screwed. But, you know, if I'm falling at some point, what I'm perceiving are the information of how my body's moving in relation to how can I possibly fall? How can I, you know, all these things are if I'm in a car accident, the relevant information is the motion of these respective vehicles and obstacles. Yeah. So that's what in those moments you're probably laser focusing into. Um, and I think like from an ecological perspective, I think it's fair to say that it can sort of meaningfully dilate. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like you, you, you dig down deep enough, and time gets really fucking confusing. Right? Oh yeah. But uh, yeah. like, if we, you know, like I, I try to treat things as sort of like a, you know, rational materialist sort of standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, and one way to think about it is, I mean, a classic experience that everyone also has is that, is that time seems to accelerate as you age mm-hmm. right so for for a, a child of five years old a year is a, an incredibly long period of time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for a 40 year old a year can feel like it you know you sneezed and it was over right mm-hmm. one way to perceive it is that well, what percentage of your lifespan is represented by that year? Um, the other is like, how much re- new relative inform- uh, relevant information is being absorbed or how much development is happening, mm-hmm. right? So a, a five-year-old and the, and the six-year-old a year later are dramatically different human beings with dramatically different effectivities, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and perceptual capacities, right? And a 39 year old and a four year old are much more similar to each other. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So the same period of time has passed, but the amount of relevant developmental information mm-hmm. that the athlete, uh, that the, that the organism has sort of attuned itself is, is much smaller mm-hmm. for the 40 year old. So the, the time just doesn't have the same, the same, um, it doesn't feel the same. Mm-hmm. Right. But is that, but, I mean, time didn't really, you know, 
I wouldn't say that time is passing differently for me than for my child in any sort of objectively measurable out external sense. It's an, it's an interest subjective. It's a subjective mm -hmm. experience. And I'd say the same thing is true of the, the sense of, I would expect that the same thing is true of the sense of time dilation that we have in emergencies, right? Mm -hmm. Or in flow states, right? It's, it's, it's not that some objective met, uh, metric of the world outside of us is changing. Mm -hmm. It's that our attunement to the world has changed in a dramatic way mm -hmm. that, that messes with our time perception or that messes with our time perception is the wrong way to think about it because it's not an error, right? Mm -hmm. Though I've seen some people posit that, like I've seen that somebody write uh, this, uh, I've seen this idea that flow states involve such perception that the time that essentially the keeping time in the brain is shut down. Mm -hmm. The area that keeps time in the brain sort of turns off when you're in a flow state because you're so, you have so much demands on attuning to the kind of motor information that you're just sort of in it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's true or not, but another way to think about it for me would be that, that like, like, like John would say, insight cascades are another way to, right. uh, to describe the flow state. And if it's an insight cascade and there's just lots of relevant information coming in and you're transforming in important ways during the experience, or at least mm -hmm. relevant to what you're trying to achieve within that experience, um, the, yeah, you're going to experience time in a different way. Mm -hmm. You're going to experience time perception in a different way. There's a difference this between time, I think, time perception. This is making me think of the conversation you're having with John. Because there's some very, very deeply held um, beliefs, I don't know what you would maybe call them, or paradigms, right, that they go where you, I don't know whether you want to say Plato, or, I mean, Descartes, obviously, he makes the Cartesian grid, um, mm. you know, which is huge. Um, so that's sort of in terms of space, Descartes says, we've got a grid. And it's got three axes and then everything goes into that mm -hmm. um, and then newton does something very similar with time where he says time is absolute uh this probably this generalization i'm trying to remember exactly but he says time time flows from nothing but itself you know it's absolute and mathematical um so then what you get is sort of this primordial timeline mm -hmm. and any event that ever happens has to be placed within the timeline. Yeah. Any object that ever exists has to be placed within the, the sort of a grid, mm -hmm. right? Um, but Gibson, and I think following Dewey and James, sort of this is the, come, I mean, he's coming right after the American pragmatist. He's saying that, I mean, Gibson's direct quote is he says, space is the ghost of objects and time is the ghost of events. So that he, he calls them in that the the abstract time is he calls an intellectual achievement, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something that we've come up with. It's obviously tremendously useful, whether it be in physics or just, you know, getting to the same place at the same time. But what we've sort of done, and Tim Ingle touches on this, he calls it the logic of inversion, is that we've taken that like achievement and we posit it to be primary. So that has like a big, big, big impact because then it's like, well, whatever happens, it's still only sitting within an absolutely objective, untouchable frame, whether that be temporal or spatial. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I'm definitely operating within that, that mm -hmm. axiomatic structure. Right. And, for me, the fact that the axiomatic structure works is evidence to some degree that the axiomatic structure is correct, right? Um, like, you know, uh, like, I, I don't know how well I understand these things sometimes, right? But Gödel's incompleteness theorem, I think, is right. a really, really key insight, right? And it tells us essentially that within a, once we set up an axiomatic structure, we cannot justify that axiomatic structure from within it, right? Mm -hmm. So... So if you take as an axiom that time itself is a, is a stable objective feature of the environment, then that, 
that lends you a certain ability to 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 act within the world, right? Mm -hmm. And to conceptualize things in ways that are useful. Mm -hmm. Is it justifiable within that from once you've, you know, started with that axiomatic structure? I don't know, right? Um, and maybe, mm -hmm. maybe there's another, another outer structure where we can get to justifying that. But sometimes what I, you know, when I struggle with some of these conversations, with people are kind of diving into the mysticism or the, the idealism mm -hmm. is I don't understand what, what explanatory power their, their structure affords them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like, okay, cool. So you, you let's, let's, if we put time in jeopardy, mm -hmm. what does that afford me? Right. Like maybe if I'm a physicist, it affords me things that I absolutely need. Right. Mm -hmm. But if I'm a, if I'm a movement teacher, does it afford me mm -hmm. anything that's useful to me or does it just get me confused? I think that's a very relevant question. So I think this is how I would answer. Gibson explicitly delimits his theory to what he calls ecological scale, mm -hmm. which is essentially mid-sized things moving at living organism speed, okay. right? So he's not getting quantum. He's not getting you yeah. know, black holes, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, which I mean, I'm sure there's relevant reasons physicists got to do their thing, but. No, no, I, yeah, yeah, sorry. What I, Gibson they, is saying is like, Yep, I'm going to draw a box around this. This is what he calls ecological scale. Yeah. Um, you know, this planet, these kind of living things that we've seen. Um, and it's a very deeply evolutionary theory. Yes. So what, so Gibson starts, I think actually, uh, this came up in the conversation with John. So if you mm -hmm. read, um, you're talking about when you're talking about nominalism, mm -hmm. Gibson starts and he says, if you read the ecological approach to visual perception, he starts the whole half, first half of the book, he's just talking about surfaces and vertices and edges and, you know, mediums and substrates, all these things like, and you're like, why is he just like, I want to know about my eye. How does my eye work? You know? Yeah. So what he starts from is this idea that we perceive the environment. What does the environment have to be for me to be perceivable? Yeah. Right. And sort then of. he comes out with sort of an evolutionary theory of perceptual systems that are attuned to specifying information that is grounded in physical law. You know, the way that light reflects off of things is whether it's eternal or whatever platonic, it doesn't really matter for our purposes. Those things are about as deep as you can get. And from an evolutionary framework, it makes a lot of sense to say that that's how our perceptual systems work. Yeah. So I think that for me is relevant for movement is to say, ah, ecolo uh, you know, uh, evolutionarily, it, it would make sense that it's based off of a stable physical laws that are present within the organism environment niche, um, you know, that are relevant for action. And that's where I feel like putting first physical laws like abstract time or abstract space they get us sort of away from in my thinking how how our bodies and perceptual systems work but there has to be something there right i mean sorry i'm confused with where you the move you just did there because in order to so his you know you know, Ravicki has, has framed the question something like ancient epistemology asks, how, what, is, what must the world be like such a, that it is intelligible, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's his claim, which is basically, it's essentially the same thing as Gibson, but maybe on a different scale, right? Yeah. So he's saying, what must the perceived world be like such that we can perceive it? Mm -hmm. And what, what is the nature of that perceived world, right? And how, do, how does the sort of organism evolve attunement to what's mm -hmm. perceivable? Mm -hmm. um, but in order to kind of get to something that's perceivable, it feels like you have to have the grounding of light reflects off things. Right. Right. So you, ha you have to, you have to have that as an ontological prior, right? <laughs> in order to, to make the, the ecological thing work. 
I suppose. Right. I so mean, you can't, you, once you once you put all those other things in jeopardy, then then the the theory has nothing to ground itself on. Right. So I guess the pragmatic argument is it's sufficient for animals to navigate. And theoretically, if you throw in a Darwinian piece to stay alive and reproduce yeah. whatever. Um, and I think he's, you know, he's following the pragmatic tradition. So I think he's saying, you know, something like the way right, light reflects or the way that gravity functions on Earth it's probably as stable as you're going to get for something for organisms to sort of mold around. Mm -hmm. um, what, do, what do you think about that? Well, yeah, I mean, there, you have to have stable features of the environment mm -hmm. in order to, in order to evolve a visual, uh, a perceptual system that attunes to the environment. If, right. the, if the systems are, 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 there's nothing that is stable. Stable. There's nothing gr that's ground, right? Mm -hmm. um, notice the metaphor there. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, then there's no way to to couple to the environment. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things that you might need to have as a stable feature in order to have a, a plausible explanatory kind of thing is is time. Right. How so? What do, what do we gain from it, I guess? Well, I mean, an organism, an organism is, is motivated to do two things, right? It's motivated to like at, at the, the most basic level, there's a verse of an appetitive uh -huh. drives, right? We move towards things that nourish us and away from things that are hazardous to us. Right? Things that fulfill needs and things that, that inhibit or destroy, right? Mm -hmm. it, in, order to, in order to be able to move forward towards something, mm -hmm. there has to be a dimension of there has to be a future state that we can get to. So the moment that we have appetite and that appetite is not met, we have the assumption of a future in which the appetite can be met, which means time, hmm. right? Or the moment that we have a hazard that can be avoided, then again, there's a future state in which we have avoided that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, have you read Maps of Meaning by, by Peterson? I listened to the lecture series. I didn't actually read the book after that. The book is really like, I, I think you do well with the book. Mm -hmm. um, it took me like a year to read it. Honestly, it's a hard book. It's much mm -hmm. more difficult to digest than the lecture series. Mm -hmm. And there were times at which I was like, why is he using this jargony, difficult language? Like he uses the term valence over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that if you just said value, it mm -hmm. would get you exactly what you're trying to achieve here. I could mm -hmm. be wrong, but it's not written to be easy to read, right? It's written mm -hmm. within, within a pastiche of academic jargons, which is unique, right? Like right. nobody else is like marrying Gibson to Skinner to, to James to Young, right? And mm -hmm. so it's just, it's weird. Mm -hmm. But once you read it, it, it's very powerful, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, one of his fundamental things is that we tell stories, right? Mm -hmm. And stories are basically about the, they're, they're basically about when predictions fail, right? Mm -hmm. Right, like, so, so he talks about a, a mundane story, a prosaic story, and like a heroic story, right? So. Mm -hmm. If I if I was to tell you a story, I was hungry. I went to the mm -hmm. to I went to the to the, the kitchen and I made a peanut butter sandwich and then I ate it. That story would be uninteresting to you. It would be boring. You would have mm -hmm. zero interest in the story. I had a motivational frame. I fulfilled the motivational frame. The frame ended. I moved on. That's um, 
it, it, it contains no information about how you solve problems in the future. Mm -hmm. Everything about that story um, is essentially loaded with, with irrelevance, right? Because mm -hmm. all those things that I talked about are things that you've already solved, mm -hmm. right? And so they've been coded as essentially irrelevant, right? Now, if I tell you a story about how I went to the kitchen and, you know, um, a series of weird events happened that prevented me from eating my, my, uh, my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now that story is potentially interesting mm -hmm. because it contains information about novel situations that might inhibit you from getting to a goal mm -hmm. that you have. Mm -hmm. So everything in, everything in, in maps of meaning is basically about this idea that, that life is this eternal, this eternal thing of basically being in the unbearable present, trying to move towards the ideal future. Mm -hmm. You're either, the, the present is always, the present always has some, generally the present is insufficient in some way. Right. Because otherwise you don't have motivation, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, you know, if you're in sati or awakened or you're meditating, maybe you achieve this state where like, all desire, your desire free. And that's great. Mm -hmm. But that's generally pretty limited. Right? Mm -hmm. Aside from that, what life is, is essentially the arising of a motivational state. And then the attempt to, to fulfill that motivational state to satiate that motivational state. And then that frame ends, and then you do the next thing, right? So you're hungry, you eat, then, then you're bored. So you go watch TV, mm -hmm. right? Then you're tired. So you go sleep, right? Motivational state, need of the organism, right? And so you always have a future state and a present state. And you're always trying to move to the future state. And then the story, the narratives, what are interesting are what happens when something interrupts your ability to get to the ideal future. Mm -hmm. And that's the descent into the underworld. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where we grow as human beings, mm -hmm. right? So we have this, this loop that we're going through. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I don't know, like it, it, you. I don't think it like negates the mythology or the hero's journey in any way. I think, cause I mean, I was just reading in England, what? he was talking about stories, the, like the, the idea of time or, you know, whether it's yeah. abstract or whatever. Cause England says something similar. He actually lived like among circumpolar people for like several years. Um, but he was talking about a story and, you know, very similarly, he was saying, purpose of story is not to recreate past events mm -hmm. purpose of story is to educate the attention of others to you know information that's relevant for action mm -hmm. you know i tried to get to the fridge but the bear was there in yeah. the kitchen you know whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> right Nietzsche um, says this too right the purpose of history isn't the objective truth of history mm -hmm. it's, it's how it educates how we act which which is true, but then Foucault went and destroyed it. Because <laughs> we can, you, if we manipulate it too much, then we go away from, we, we, we propagandize it, right? Mm. Rather than always interpreting it with an eye towards how it, it, it guides relevant action. Right. We go ahead, keep going. No, I mean, that was just the, uh, the point, I suppose. Okay, so, um, yeah. Without, without positing that time exists, I think you can't posit the existence of a future state. Well, the way that I see it is like, state, then there's no, there's no motivate. There's no way to, I mean, what is motivation, right? Motivation is the thing that moves you. Right. In order to, but move, I think we don't have, have to, to say place to place which takes time. Yeah. I think what I'm saying though, is not, it's not that time doesn't exist, right? If I'm hungry and there's PB and J in the fridge, it's not that, oh, this is in some inaccessible black hole, which I can, right? The point is that this is an event, right? And the event is continuous. The event involves my current hunger, right? My journey, my, adventurous journey to the fridge, right? And, you know, then the satiation of this and all of that. And these are all events. Um, 
and it obviously would be ludicrous to say that these events aren't real. They're also obviously nested. I think that's probably uh, uncontroversial, right? You know, they exist in some sort of a recursive nested structure. And, you know, from out of that, we can certainly say then, well, I was hungry. I tried to go to the fridge, you know, such and such happened. I finally, you know, right. And this is the story. Wait, I went, I went to get my peanut butter and jelly and I realized that my, my roommate had eaten all of yeah. the peanut my peanut butter. Yeah. You know, they just moved in and now I know something about my roommate that I didn't know before. Right. Uh, so then I had to have a chat with them and they freaked out and I found PCP pipes in there. <laughs> an interesting story, right. Right. So, but I, so, okay. So, so the, so time is the ghost of events. Right. So then time is something that we can say after we've had these stories, you know, say, oh, you tried to get to your fridge. I tried to get to my fridge. Um, you know, maybe there's a way we can compare these events. Right. And it's obviously based, I mean, time historically is based in repetitive movements like sun, stuff, moon, movements of tides, things like that. Right. So that sort of maybe grounds it a bit. But what I'm sort of pushing back against is the idea that you perceive time directly and then it sort of becomes populated or filled in with things. I'm saying is that the events are first, no matter how subtle they are, whether you're sort of counting in your head or whatever, you're always creating some type of events. I don't know if you've ever done sensory deprivation, right? Yeah, no, I, I, but, I get what you're saying, which is that, um, you perceive events and time is an emergent sort of perception from the, mm -hmm. the, the serial nature of events mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. without events, there's no, there's nothing to perceive, which we, mm -hmm. we know that, that if you, if you put someone in yeah, sensory deprivation, that their time perception is, 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 uh, um, is distorted. So right. there's still, there is still time perception because yeah. There's always There's events happening events. within the body. Yeah. Right? The yeah. body is a series of events happening, right? Every yeah. heartbeat can be seen as an event. Every breath can be seen as an event. And so we're entrained to some degree off mm -hmm. of intero perception mm -hmm. to have uh, a serial perception of, of, um, of whatever it is <laughs> that is unfolding. <laughs> right. You know, I've seen right. from a physics perspective, the idea that the time is the measurement of entropy increasing, right? Mm -hmm. Every event increases the entropy of the universe. And, you know, and in the, from that perspective, like entropy, you know, is always increasing at the same rate, mm -hmm. right? Globally across the entire universe, right? Locally, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to shift dramatically um, at a, whatever scale you're looking at, it might be dramatic, mm -hmm. but, but if you smooth the entire universe, you would, you, I, w I would posit that, you know, you know, I think that like humans have a certain perceptual speed is my yeah. understanding, right? Like, like a, that was something I read in a book called um, Inside of a Dog, which is uh -huh. about this uh, umwelt of a dog, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. They're saying that dogs see about twice as fast as human beings. So they capture, you know, uh, more frames per second mm -hmm. and i mean i think that that's a unit uh, an event that you can treat as sort of a as a as a ground rock for human perception which is how many how many images can you capture in your brain you know in your perceptual system within a given period of time Right. But I guess what I'm going to push back there is to say the concept of images we're only taking probably from video. Sure. Right. So, I mean, you hear yeah, they say, oh, if a fly would watch a movie, it would look like a slideshow. Yeah. And that makes sense. But what I'm saying is not that I disagree with that. I think it's probably true. But I think that is only just a relationship to the, the activity of the animal. So, like, a fly moves at a certain speed. How do we know how fast it perceives? Well, because it moves in that way. So for something to move in that way, it would have to, because it sure as hell can't be perceiving like us. 
you know, if it's flying that way, but yeah. you know, that's the whole idea of the perception action coupling of perception systems is that they already are, um, you know, they're already built in with the, the way that that animal, the niche of the animal and the way that it moves and orients itself. Sorry, now I'm distracted by the idea. I wonder if sloths would perceive slideshows as movies. <laughs> That's right. a good one. Right? Is their perceptual system downed tuned to the speed of, right. of, of, of sloth movement, right? How much, right. How much time does a, does a sloth need, you know, what, what unit of time does a sloth need to be attuned to in order to achieve its very slow lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Or I suppose you could ask what, what are the structure of the events that are relevant to the sloth? Yeah. You know, based on how it moves and what its niche is, all that stuff. So um, you commented on the video with, with Verveke, and I'm trying to remember the, the nature of the comment. There was something really specific that you wanted to, to kind of uh, come in oh, on. I can't, I can't, yeah. I feel like we haven't necessarily gotten all the way there. Yeah, yeah, let's see. I think what I was speaking about was a little bit with the, uh, the motivation part. Okay, yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a tricky one. I'm not gonna pretend that I've gotten close to. <laughs> to figuring that out. But the move that I would make is to say, <laughs> there, there's a quote, like <laughs> this guy, Scott Kelso, he's a, does coordination dynamics, but in his book, he, he quotes Haldane. Um, and it's a little probably off color for 2021, but he says, teleology is like uh, biologist, Jack Haldane. JB, JBS Haldane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the quote from Haldane is, teleology is like a biologist mistress. You can't live with her, but you can't live without her, but you can't be seen with her in public. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's true. Um, the sense that it's, it's a hard thing to, you know, you get these reductive guys like Dennett, everything's predetermined from the sort of a third person perspective yeah. and all this stuff, right? Um, or you have sort of, the kind of more uh, internal executive that generates whatever. That's sort of the the ghost in the machine, probably for cognitive uh, psych psychology these How days. Mind works right. Um, but what I would say is like that the motivation you can't really consider it independently of the niche right like so like let's say um you know i get an urge to look at my phone as like a lot of us do nowadays right well i mean i didn't have that yeah 10 15 years whenever you know before this was such a thing um you know it's not to say i think this is for me was the strength of gibson was to say you got the behaviorists who are saying you know this is only a lawful regularity between stimulus and response. Mm -hmm. So it's, if you control the stimulus, you can control the response, right? Um, that's, you know, Skinner in a nutshell from yeah. what I understand. Yeah. <laughs> and then- It doesn't work that way, but yeah. No, of course, right. And then you've got um, the whole cognitive revolution that came through with like Chomsky and Polition and Fodor. And they're like, well, it's essentially starts from inside, you know? Um, and Gibson's kind of like, it's neither of these or both, if you like, mm -hmm. because, you know, we're all assuming, right. And this gets back to the subject object stuff Yeah. that, that these things are sort of split. Um, and I think, where it gets really tricky is when you bring in the idea of like time scales, because a lot of times when you ask like, where's the motivation come from? It depends like, well, on what time scale are you kind of arbitrarily distinguishing this event, right? Because I mean, Peterson speaks about this, I think, right? He's like, well, if you want to get a PB and J from the fridge, what are you really doing? You know, are you, 
you know, it's nested yeah. within so it's many nested. different. It's nested, right. yeah. So we'll say it, like he, he gives example in in the class, right? Like, um, or, or a recent example he gave, I think, talking to Ellen McGoldcrest is, you know, um, he's writing a book, right? So what is he doing? Well, right. typing letters on his computer. Okay, that that's one one mm -hmm. layer. What's the next layer? Well, he's 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 making words. Mm -hmm. right? And the next layer is those words are, are sentences. The, the sentences are paragraphs. Those paragraphs are chapters and all of that is within a book. Well, what's mm -hmm. the purpose of the book, right? So the purpose of the, the typing the letter is the word, which is and then, okay, well, he's trying to write a book because he's trying to be, uh, you know, a millionaire or, <laughs> or he's already that, mm -hmm. or he's trying to be a good citizen or because he wants the world to change. He wants to, you know, fight off fascism, whatever it is, right? And then that's nested within whatever his highest ideal is, right? So, mm -hmm. it's, you know, another example he gives is, um, is you know, he's he's lecturing to college students. It's like you're you're here at the lecture. You're attending to me, right? Why are you attending to me? You're attending to me because you're motivated to get a good grade in this class. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Why are you motivated to get a good grade in this class? Because you're motivated to finish your degree. You're motivated mm -hmm. to finish your degree because you want to, you know take on a certain profession, right? Mm -hmm. Motivated to take on a certain profession. And always it kind of nests up to what is your ideal that you're oriented towards and mm -hmm. whether you, whether you can articulate it or not, his argument mm -hmm. is essentially you're, you're, you're always operating within a frame that's nested within the ideal, which is mm -hmm. why he comes back to the idea that essentially at the root of everything is something religious, that every question kind of descends to the question of the religious, which is interesting. Sorry, I'm just, I'm kind of on a tangent here, but I want to keep this going because mm -hmm. one of the arguments in Maps of Meaning is that psychology doesn't recognize that that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. That psychology claims to be sort of teleologically um, neutral, right? Mm -hmm. Just like just like the the, um, the biologist mistress is, is teleology, like same thing for the psychologist, right? Mm -hmm. Because in order to define a disorder, you have to be able to define what the proper order is. Right, right. And so we have all of these, you know, the DSIM, which, you know, is, uh, or the DSM, like all these disorders are, are defined, but what psychology has been shy to do is actually define what the ideal is. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about this recently because I was reading some political controversy stuff around um, normalization of pedophilia, right? Mm -hmm. And and I was thinking about this idea, this idea that like I don't know if I want to put this part in the actual <laughs> podcast. This is getting controversial here, but uh, okay. Garfunkel and Oates wrote a song called um, "Sex with Ducks," right? <laughs> it's based on this Pat Robertson quote: "If you if you legalize gay marriage, you know everyone's going to start having sex with ducks." It's a slippery slope fallacy, seemingly. But there's something weird that's happening with our culture where it's like, now we have drag queen story hour. Now we want kids to be able to go to pride parades where people are dressed up in kink and we want to expose them to BDS. So people are are advocating for this. Now we want to treat we're treating pedophilia as a as a as a sexual orientation that's unchangeable mm -hmm. right which then removes the moral aspect of it right it's not a sin it's not immoral to be a pedophile it's moral to act out pedophilia mm -hmm. and so there's a strong determinism woven in yeah there is but there's this, like that's starting to look to me like Pat Robertson, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the next step, like it, it's totally coherent within that worldview to say someone who is sexually attracted to ducks mm -hmm. is, is just that way, right? Mm -hmm. That's, they're just biologically sexually attracted to ducks, right? And mm -hmm. then, it's, then it's just an orientation, right? Mm -hmm. Like if someone can have a, you know, a trans identity of being a cat, right? Why can't, why can't, you know, there's no logical reason that within that framework, 
um, sexual attraction to animals isn't isn't permissible. Mm -hmm. And then, then who's to say that a duck can't give consent? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How would you define that? Mm -hmm. And and the thing is that I think that what I'm what I'm what I'm playing with is that. is that there's a reason why you might say that the ideal is a monogamous heterosexual marriage that produces children, mm -hmm. right? That that is, the, that is the, the state that is most psychologically healthy for a human being. And that once you have that ideal, then it stabilizes a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And you can say, hey, homosexuality is, is less ideal, right? Mm -hmm. But we'll say that it's, it, it has no moral, it has no significant moral compromise, right? It, mm -hmm. it does no harm. So then we could say, well, well, sexual attraction to children, like it's much more important from a sort of keeping people safe or helping somebody achieve a, a healthy psychology. It's much more important that they that we have treatments that work for minor attraction than treatments that work for, for, for homosexual attraction. Does that make sense? Yeah. I guess I'm just wondering where, what do you ground healthy? And then again, like I think you just were asking that. Well, well that, that's the claim is that essentially at the bottom, it ends up religious and that without a religious, without a ideal that you're oriented towards, it becomes yeah. ungrounded and there is no way to ground. And then you have this, this, this just, just. Right. But then that, <laughs> I mean, it that sounds goes just sounds like, ridiculous. I mean, it, am I wrong or is that kind of the youth of froze dilemma of like, well then what's that grounded in, you know, is it moral because the God's will it or the God's will it because it's moral. That's mm -hmm. kind of the classic youth of fro. Dilemma yeah. Yeah. Thing, I've read, right? I've read right. the youth of I sent it to my, yeah my uh my business partner who's a who's an orthodox christian who went to uh i'm not orthodox in that sense but he's a he's a devout devout mm -hmm. jesus follower who went to oral roberts right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, i grew up i grew up in the church um you know i was deeply religious myself up until around college several years thereafter mm -hmm. so I mean, in terms of experience, I've, you know, kind of been through that. Um, you know, I've had various phases. John's work was big for me. Finding John was big for me. Um, yeah. I think that was, that was a, a moment that I, I think it was like a reconstructive moment. Um, you know, you guys are talking about deconstruction, reconstruction, and I think finding John and his work was, I'm sure, like similar for many people, was a big, was a big help. So, a little technical difficulty there, but um, basically, you know, Peterson's argument in in Maps of Meaning is that is that you can't define disorder without an ideal, and that once mm -hmm. you are you can't coherently define disorder without an ideal. And that once you try to define an ideal, essentially it becomes a religious question. Mm -hmm. And I guess his answer to that is we, we, we have to dig into the stories that have been passed down to us and try mm -hmm. to articulate out their messages on a deeper level than we've ever done so before, which I think is actually really aligned with, with Verveke's argument as well. I mean, Verveke's mm -hmm. basically um, talking about how do we recover the wisdom traditions of the past in a way that that is sort of attuned to the current situation. Mm -hmm and has the capacity to evolve effectively for the situation as it continues to arise. Yeah. I think the one thing that I, that I appreciate in the way John speaks about things is to me, there's like a sense of process 
-hmm. even when he's speaking about history. So he's saying like what you're getting with the best history isn't just, oh, in this scenario, this happened and this, you know, applies to this event, you know, how long, however long ago, but um, there's something to this is a way of adaptation. So there's a built in process focus mm -hmm. um, as a, and I think that's always an interesting tension for me with like the idea of an ideal. Well, it's like, well, what is the ideal? It has to be something that is capable of continually adapting, you know? Um, so you yeah. get sort of that sort of a odd paradoxical thing where it's like, can there be something that is continually able to adapt and whether you're saying update or, you know, continue to be relevant. Um, but then it's like, by virtue of that, that becomes almost a static ideal. Well, I mean, yeah. And I mean, at that point, you're sort of getting into the sort of the, the issue of the thing being and becoming right. The, mm -hmm. the, the thing that is, the thing that is stable across time, the thing that has the capacity to change across time, right? Right. Itself. But what, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on Peterson here, but this is Peterson's description of the archetypal hero, right? Mm -hmm. is, is, the, is the individual that has adopted, the, that has cultivated the virtue of character that allows them to, to uh -huh solve the set of all games mm -hmm. the meta game right so he talks about sportsmanship and how you know we we tell kids that it's not it's not whether you win or lose it's how you play the game and what we're pointing them towards is that the 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 local game is actually not what the purpose of the game is the purpose of the game is the training for the meta game mm -hmm. and i actually think you know this is right at the heart of my work, right? This mm -hmm. is what involvement play is all about. And I actually think that you you see this this sort of idea generating up within the, the, the fitness world because mm -hmm. CrossFit actually articulates this, right? Mm -hmm. Right. They have this idea of the fittest athlete is the athlete that is best able to, that performs best across the set of all possible movement tasks. Right. They don't use the exact verbiage, but that's that's basically what they talk. They talk, they talk about this model of the infinite hopper in CrossFit Journal One, mm -hmm. infinite hopper of physical tasks. If you imagine it could generate any number of physical tasks, um, the athlete who performed the best across all of them is the fittest athlete. So that's your goal as an athlete, right? Mm -hmm. So then you could say that, like, well, what I would say is that actually the point of being an athlete isn't to solve movement tasks; mm -hmm. it's to solve movement tasks is to use solving movement tasks as a laboratory to construct the type of character that can solve any type of task. Right, right. I think they talk about learning to learn to move. Yeah. Right. Or, or um, um, cultivating adaptability, right? Or mm -hmm. anti-fragility, right? Mm -hmm. I think anti-fragility, Taleb's concept is, um, a good way to it's basically positive adapt, adaptation because one of the things right. about adapt, adaptations is that they can actually be negative or they can mm -hmm. be um they can be sort of uh they can be traps right so mm -hmm. an organism can evolve a, a characteristic with an environment that is uh that's successful within that environment, but then mm -hmm. actually makes them less able to adapt to new environments and become- the local adaptation. Yeah, yeah, local adaptation. So anti-fragility would be sort of the principle of, of adaptation that allows mm -hmm. you to, um, to, is when your adaptations make you more adaptable to future potential environments as well. Mm -hmm. And this is in some sense what, maybe what a human being is that's unique is it's, it's a, it's a, that, that, that idea that we are able to um, simulate the, the Darwinian process um, internally mm -hmm. creates a potential for this anti-fragile adaptation that, um, 
that that's potentially really useful or or maybe we're just going to kill ourselves off we don't know <laughs> but it's one way to think about it right um so yeah i mean and you know you, you probably heard me talk about this it's like well what is what is that well, the first thing i would say is that we can't know <laughs> right we can't know perfectly what it is Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I place mystery as sort of the, the highest mm -hmm. principle, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, what did, what did, uh, who, who, it was in one of Verveke's, or I think it was in Verveke's conversation with, with um, Jordan recently, mm -hmm. um, where they said, um, I followed, he was quoting someone who said, I followed Jesus, but Socrates is my teacher. <laughs> right and peterson said well maybe that's the whole story of the west right maybe that's what western mm -hmm. civilization is mm -hmm. um and i would say that like there's some interesting relationship between the insights of christianity and insights of taoism that is sort mm -hmm. of central to to mm -hmm. the way that i'm looking at the world but mm -hmm. like and 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 obviously evolution right like i think mm -hmm. so many of these problems become comprehensible once you understand selection mm -hmm. like you know what is verbeke's relevance realization it's it's opponent processing through selection creates this capacity to realize relevance mm -hmm. right he sets up a number of different ones but but you couldn't i don't think you can get verbeke without darwin mm -hmm. so so darwin's insight to me is 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 absolutely crucial. And I don't think we can solve any of these things that we're trying to do without, without integrating it. And that's where I think a lot of people are failing. I think even people who believe in evolution don't really grasp how profound Darwin's insight, right. and how much it impacts the way that we have to perceive everything. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, Jordan Peterson's critique of, of Sam Harris is that he, he, he accepts evolution, but doesn't think like a Darwinian. He thinks like a Newtonian. Mm -hmm. But in any event, so I would say the outermost frame is mystery, right? Mm -hmm. And this is this is Peterson too, right? There's the Ouroboros, the, the worm of chaos. And then within that frame, the highest way to behave is through agopic love, right? The love that wants to bring good into being. Mm -hmm. And then in order to do that, you have to be seeking truth, right? You have to be trying to align yourself as deeply with reality as possible. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, I don't think you can serve love, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're making reality your enemy, right? And yeah. when you lie, when you, when you don't seek truth, when you allow truth to not be central, you're, you're not doing it. So it's like agape logos. And then um, and then it takes courage. It takes, it takes awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Horus the vision, all right? Perception. Mm -hmm. And then comprehension, understanding, and then equanimity, like emotional res uh, reservations, and then courage and strength, right? Mm -hmm. Physical strength and then skillfulness. And so it's like the heroic individual, the adaptable individual is the individual who has placed himself in service of the highest principles. Mm -hmm. and then has proactively cultivated those capacities of character that allow them to actually serve that out. And this is where mm -hmm. I think so much of like the counterculture fell down because it said, mm -hmm. oh, all you need is love. It's like, well, no, <laughs> yeah. that doesn't work, right? right? You need to to serve love as the highest principle, right? Mm -hmm. well, re while recognizing your humility in the face of the great mystery that is being mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. cultivating the the qualities of character that allow you to act out love as a mode of being. Mm -hmm. That's my, that's my conception of the ideal. I like that. I'm going to go back to one thing you were saying with, uh, Taleb's anti-fragility concept. I've read a little Taleb, not a ton, you know, familiar somewhat with the anti-fragility concept. There's a very parallel, um, and this is, this is more on a local level of movement, maybe not so much in the uh, sense of like ideals and yeah. these big frames. But um, if you're familiar with metastability, 
would be uh, it comes from this guy Kelso um, coordination dynamics where it's sort of the tendency of complex systems to to kind of optimize um, both integration and segregation, right? So it's yeah, that's it's the way he talks about that. That's that's compl right. complexification is the the process of of of, of diversification and unification in mm -hmm. in 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 parallel, right? And I'm always I'm always curious whenever uh, Verveke talks about that. I'm always like, because anti fragility is a really good concept. Metastability is like it's probably on the more technical side. Yeah. So you know it has like a mathematical formalization and stuff. Um, but I'm always curious, like, if John's familiar with it, because I'm always like, oh, this sounds exactly what you guys are talking about. Um, it's quite, quite close with also the, the criticality concept that he uses in his, his uh, insight cascade model. Mm -hmm. um, but that's very central. Like, if you talk to Eduardo Araujo mm -hmm. um, and the ecological dynamics people, what we're doing is we're very often trying to channel performers into these metastable regions where um, where the reorganization of the organism environment task space is possible. Um, you know, based on sort of these perturbations, right? So like you can have a system that if you perturb it, it you know, it doesn't change at all, it's monostable, or if you perturb it has two sort of stable attractors, right? Um, it would be, you know, bistable, uh, multi-stable. And then you have sort of this fluidity that's where you're not locked in, right? You're not locked in to any one of these stable attractor states, right? But you're still able to, um, to respond to the information in sort of a fluid way. So it becomes really big in, in movement. Mm -hmm. And it's very, I mean, I always look at it um, and I'm always like, I feel like this is very similar to anti-fragility thing, but I'm always curious, like, cause the people who speak about metastability is always purely technical. Yeah. And I'm always curious to like put that in dialogue with, with some of that stuff a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, so, Taleb's description of just fragile, res, uh, resilient, and anti-fragile. Mm -hmm. So a a fragile thing breaks when it's exposed to a perturbance or a just yeah you mm -hmm. know uh, to a stressor. A resilient thing is unchanged, and a anti-fragile thing changes in a positive direction. Right. Right. So um, you know you. Uh, you place a heavy weight on a piece of china and it breaks. Mm -hmm. You play that's fragile. You place a heavy weight on a uh, on a um, on a on a steel block. Nothing changes about it. Mm -hmm. But you place a heavy weight on a human being, and and if it's not excessively heavy, mm -hmm. then the human being becomes stronger. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's anti fragile. Mm -hmm. And and one of the key concepts is that systems that are that are anti fragile, they're they're systems that gain from disorder, mm -hmm. right? So when you're talking about metastability, and you say like you know you perturb it, it just goes to a stable uh, a stable place, that sounds kind of like re resilience, right? Right. Um, but right. The, the the point about a human being is that, or and he says this is true of economic systems or businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Is that actually if you remove too much stressor from their environment, then mm -hmm. they will eventually reach a point where they're not sufficiently anti-fragile anymore and there'll be a big disaster, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, an example I like to give is, I think people don't fall down enough, mm -hmm. right? I also think people don't experience enough minor pain, mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you, you know, a child falls down all the time and is basically able to recover from falls very well, um, at least most healthy active children but over time a lot of times adults stop behaving in ways that result in falls that are that are regular mm -hmm. and so that when they fall they have a, 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 a you know catastrophic consequence to a fall that might have been 
very normal when they were younger. Mm -hmm. So that system has become fragile. I also think that may be true, and this is totally, this is speculative on my part. I don't have good research to back this up, but I have the sense that essentially, uh, you know, we know that pain is an output of the, of the, of the, it's a subjective output of the central nervous system. It's not a objective quality of a tissue, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what happens, I think, is that when, when a nervous system can't calibrate itself after, off of regular small insults and stressors, mm -hmm. it becomes very fragile to mm -hmm. a, a, a stress. And so then you hit that system and you can get a, a, basically a major dysregulation of that system that can be prolonged or long lasting. I think that's one of the reasons why we might have so many problems with chronic pain, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the, the system dysregulates and ends up in a new, you know, negative attitude yeah. after a- well, I mean, I noticed that during last year, during the lockdown, I had more pain and just aches than ever, just from not, you know, from all these sources of movements being removed. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people probably experience that as well. Yeah. So I need to go pretty soon, but um, yeah. I still wanted to dig into your, I, I think there was like emergence and emanation maybe was something you wanted to touch on, but also the motivation piece. Cause I, I feel like I still haven't heard what you, what you think the answer is to the question we were, we were putting down there. So I don't think I particularly have an answer, but I think what I've been kind of mulling over is uh, this quote from Wittgenstein where he says in uncertainty, he says, uh, I make a distinction between the river and the riverbed, but not a strong one. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you've got sort of this odd interaction where on a smaller time frame, the river flows through the riverbed and is constrained, right, by you know, the gradient the material surfaces of the riverbed. But on a longer time frame, the river shapes the riverbed. Yeah. So. Carves the, the river. Right, it carves it. So you have something kind of similar, how I imagine it's happening people all moving. Time, right? Yeah, right, in many different systems. But, you know, people moving through uh, systems, even just traditions, something, you know, whether, whether it be, uh, you know, say a martial art, right? Yeah. You have entrenched, uh, you have sort of a riverbed that from your perspective as a participant you know you're going to be taught certain things yeah. um, there's certain structures that are in place and those are gonna from the from the perspective of a person's lifetime or their involvement with that sport that system those may as well almost just be rigid they're just there but in a longer time scale it's like we are actually creating those mm -hmm. um so I think every I wonder sometimes about like how that ties into a our motivation for like what what do we think of in terms of movement as being aesthetically pleasing or new or interesting um, and you know then thinking about the interaction between those time scales and sort of the emergence of avenues for that sort of a a system or a sport or a family of games or activities, right? Um, you know, what is our contribution doing to it as something that's sort of evolving through time? Yeah, I really like that analogy. It strikes me like every every parkour athlete is contributing to the carving of the riverbed of parkour, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? even as and, we're even as we're following it. Yeah. And, and that's true of everything that we do. So there's this, there's this layer of, of mutual causality that's happening. And there's right. potentially these nonlinear effects where like, you know, a certain rock gets tumbled into the river and hits a certain place. And that creates a fluid turbulence that, right. that, that changes in a, in a very large way. Um, right. The way that the, that the river behaves, which carves the, the rest of the river differently. Right. Um, and, you know, another rock of the same size might, might settle in a place where it doesn't create major uh, hydrodynamics. Right. Um, 
and that, that gets to that idea of mutual causality and also non, non-linearity. Yeah. Um, and, but I, I'm, I'm trying to map this in some way to like emergence and emanation, right? You could almost say that because, you know, in my debate with, with Jonathan Pajot, right? Like he's, mm-hmm. very, I would say he's much more emanation, right? And I'm much more mm-hmm. emergence, right? Like he sees parkour as like, it's, it's almost as if, I think in his model, it's almost as if parkour was a platonic form waiting to be discovered. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then once it's named, it sort of has emanated into the world. Right. right. Whereas I see the emanation as in, in some sense derived from the emergence. Mm-hmm. It's like something emerges up, becomes named, and then it emanates down and creates these things. And it's like, to me, the river ultimately causes the riverbed but then the riverbed becomes the cause of the river right yeah the first thing that happens is that a a drop of water falls and carves a riddle right yeah the ground is changed by the water yeah so of course you know that's the heavens coming down to the earth right symbolically it's the heavens coming down to the earth but we could say that that the, the the behavior of the drop of water is extremely complex right yeah oh, as yeah. it hits the ground and then it whatever those initial conditions are that that cause a series of 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 water to kind of move in a specific area that then carves the riverbed mm-hmm. which then conditions the behavior of all the rest of the water that comes through that area mm-hmm. and then we get all of these these reciprocal causations that sort of spiral into the future Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I mean, I suppose you could look at it the opposite way, which is that uh, the water always fa- falls on a specific piece of earth. Mm-hmm. Like there's always preconditions of the water. Right. And there's there's always preconditions of the earth that the water yeah. interacts with. Yeah. And yeah. Those preconditions are part of what are, well, they determine the path of the water. So it is, it is this mutual reciprocal causation all the way down. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, I think that's a really fruitful, fruitful representation of reality to, to play with Yeah, the river. And, and the I river. think like, cause I mean, you can, it's one of those things, the direction just is a function of the scale that you decide to look at, right? Um, have you ever come across finite and infinite games by James Cars? <laughs> you know, it comes up all the time. I haven't right. read it yet. I'm, okay. you know, I'm somewhat familiar with the idea. Yeah. Yeah. He gets into a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, and where he sort of says is what, what his point I think is that I take from it is one of the best ways that something can carry on is by having people try to, he says, if you play a game, right, you know, we're boxing, you're trying to defeat, I'm not just trying to beat you, I'm trying to beat boxing. Yeah. And my implicit goal is to become the master player. Yeah. The master player would be somebody who you don't play them because they've, you know, there's no, there's no point. They've taken all the contingency out of it. The game's done before you even play, right? Yeah. Um, which is obviously impossible for most games that are not like these kind of a well-defined thing like tic-tac-toe or something. But he says that by sort of having this implicit goal, they take on an anti-fragile structure where what you're playing against is everyone else's attempts to play against, right? So this is how it sort of, the game sort of learns. Yeah. I mean, this is very much like Piaget's idea of the iterative right. thing, right? Um, right. So, uh, I think that's very fruitful. I'm not sure how it solves the question of motivation that you are digging at, uh, though. I mean, right. I guess the motivation arises in this reciprocal p- potential of the of the underlying substrate, I guess. Like, is that right? I think the farthest that I've gotten is to say that it's the motivation, if there is one, probably is not, um, it's not aimed at 
a static final ideal, but it's a process motivation perhaps. And maybe there's a recognition of a certain way that the interaction is carrying on and maybe what that means like at greater scales, right? So if you're in the process of doing something that is sort of opening up the, the landscape or the future of that activity, maybe that is something that you experience directly even without being able to access all of the, the downstream effects. I apologize. I had too many things going on in my head <laughs> processing. Let me, let me get this out and then, then we'll come back and hopefully yeah. we'll be able to, to clear and listen better. So just within this rational material, materialist mm -hmm. framework, right? Mm -hmm. the, we don't know perfectly this conditions that gave rise to life. Mm -hmm. What we can say is that selection seems to operate mm -hmm. in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. Like there, you can, you can talk about selection in, in sort of why stars form into specific specific clusters right that, that mm -hmm. certain you know that um the larger stars will outcompete smaller stars for resources and then that's why you end up with these gravitational wells and and the, the structure of the universe right like selection exists at, at all these different levels and then you have these chemical processes that are happening on earth and you know probably on lots of other planets mm -hmm. and there are things like fire that that consume fuels that make them right mm -hmm. but they don't have the capacity to direct themselves to the fuels right mm -hmm. fire you know like wind moves fire mm -hmm. right and fire will go where there is um where there's fuel right it will follow the path where there is fuel but if you know, if you dig a trench the fire cannot intentionally leap the front uh, the, right right it can't it can't mount a defense again it can't call the wind to its aid to get it to the other side mm -hmm. it's, it's utterly reliant on these external conditions to allow it to find the fuel that feeds itself at some point right this is the argument that you know that uh uh dawkins makes in the selfish mm -hmm. gene right you have these 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 molecules that start replicating themselves and they become you know autopoetic right they become self-making mm -hmm. they seek the conditions that allow themselves and they, they have the capacity to act agentically in some sense to seek the conditions that allow their replication right and that once it might be the case that sort of there's a that selection that exists in general and sort of the way the universe is structured will always give rise to this at some point but mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a mystery, or maybe it's because there's some preceding emanationist god that 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 seeks mm -hmm. agency in 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 this material world. I don't know what you get from some of those other frames, but within mm -hmm. this frame, that thing arises. Once mm -hmm. it arises, it arises because there's potentials within the environment, right? Mm -hmm. Without without chemicals that it can consume and replicate itself. There's no replicator. Mm -hmm. So you have the, the, the rising of this, but then once it exists, it has a motivation, which is to find the things that allow it to replicate and then to avoid the things that will inhibit its replication. Right? Mm -hmm. So a fire doesn't avoid areas that doesn't avoid water, mm -hmm. right? If, if a fire is being blown towards a wind to a, to a rainstorm, it can't recognize, it has nothing that helps it couple itself to its environment to recognize mm -hmm. that there's a threat to its existence and to move in another direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at some point, there's a molecule that does. <laughs> right. And, you know, like in, in the selfish gene, uh, Dawkins, you know, postulates, you know, we don't know for sure if that first thing was even DNA based or, or, or RNA based, but eventually those replicators adopt the, the DNA. They, they start as, as these nucleic acids and that system develops over time. And then boom, mm -hmm. 
then we have motivation. Like that's the way that I tend to think about these things mm -hmm. is you start there and then what is the most fundamental thing? Well, you, you're a, it's a, it's just a chemical, it's a chemical um, process, I'm, mm -hmm. the word playing itself out that has the capacity to seek for the for things that allow it to continue playing itself out. Mm -hmm. And that's a replicator. And once the replicator exists, then selection applies to it and, you know, endless forms most beautiful. Right. Um, that's, that's where, that's where I root motivation in. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think actually that ties in quite well, I think to an activity or a sport, let's take parkour, right. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about like what I was saying, the river in the riverbed, uh, Parkour, if you almost imagine it under those selection pressures as a sort of a super organism mm -hmm. composed of all of its participants, right? There's going to be then some concepts that are going to arise. And one of those is because, like you said before, there's no way that you can, you can't uh, pre-state the workspace. You don't know what is going to arise in the future. Mm -hmm. The best thing that you can do is degeneracy. Right. Yeah. And you see that like in games, they For tend sure. to occur in families. Yeah. Um, degeneracy. degeneracy refers to the ability to adopt new strategies, new tactics, new capacities, or you to have multiple capacities that allow you to uh, achieve the same effect. Right. Well, and meaning that so uh, with throughout a population, you don't know what the optimal amount of some trait will be mm -hmm. the best thing you can do is to have a distribution right mm -hmm. of that so then you know that sort of insulates you um, so and I, I look at this in movement practices mm -hmm. i think that the sports that to me look the most whether you want to say anti-fragile or adaptive are the ones to me that seem like they are going to be able to, to be adapted in different forms. So like right now, I think it looks like American football is struggling um, from my perspective, just mm -hmm. as a whole system, right? And when I think about that, I'm like, well, how easy is it to adapt it? You can, I mean, you can play, you can play touch football, you could play smaller, you know, whatever kids used to play but it's not that easy of a game to adapt, right? You need a pretty big number of things that That's have to be there. Really hard to play pickup football. Right. It is. And, you know, you think about, well, what are the games or movement practices that are best suited to, to carry on? Or the ones that are, they lend themselves to sort of distributing across, uh, you know, having some sort of a, a branching family where they, they sort of invest in a sort of this wide array of related games or related activities. Because yeah. that sort of insulates them from whatever changes may happen that you don't, you can't predict in the future. Soccer or basketball are right. satisfying games to play mm -hmm. just by yourself, right? right. You, can go to, you can go to a court um, on a basketball hoop and you can work on dribbling and shooting and change of direction and dunking if you have the capacity mm -hmm. and you can have a very satisfying experience of the game right you can play it one-on-one -on -one, you can play it two-on-two -on -two, you can play it three-on-three -three. it scales up it nests at sort of every layer mm -hmm. you can do football drills mm -hmm. but like scoring a touchdown with nobody else there is not nearly yeah. as satisfying as shooting a basket yeah. Right. And, and like, I think soccer is maybe a little bit less satisfying to just play on your own. Yeah. But, um, but if you're, if you're working shots on goal from far enough out, it's, it's sufficiently difficult that it is inherently rewarding to hit that shot on goal. Yeah. Right? Just like shooting is sufficiently difficult that is inherently rewarding to work on, on its own. But but holding carrying a ball in your arm and getting into an end zone yeah is utterly uninteresting yeah. without someone trying to prevent you from getting into the end zone 
and the dynamics of of how football is played with the quarterback and the and the skill players and the, and the line is much harder to replicate at a at a smaller scale. Like, what does three on three American football, football. look like? Yeah, right. It's kind of incoherent at that stage. Right. But I mean, that makes sense to me. But I don't. I'm 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 not sure that I agree that football is in trouble. Right. Like what. <laughs> what is the profit margin of American football? How many players are going into football? Uh, like what, what is the talent pool of players who are entering football in, you know, in, you know, as young, as young kids. I mean, I could be wrong. I'm just curious if you know, like what, right. why do you think football is? Well, this, this is how I envision it is. And this actually ties back to parkour and some of the work that my colleague Ben is doing on skill transfer. Right. Yeah. is, yeah, you know, this idea of skill transfer, cross training. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to play basketball, but I'm training parkour or whatever secondary activity it is. Um, well, what happens then is that expands the nature by my participation in both of those. I'm bringing something new into my primary sport, right? And it's always framed sort of in context of primary, secondary sport. Or this, but there's no directionality really of the transfer. It's just people who happen to do multiple activities. So well, there's directionality to the degree that the individual has an end goal. Right. So they have an end goal. But if you think about it from the perspective of this activity as a superorganism composed of the participants, right? There's sort of a certain diversity, say, within that. So a game is sort of composed also of all the ways that people train for it. Mm -hmm. It's not just what happens within, right? Yeah, so, so the game, it, it sort of extends beyond itself into, you know, what you ate the day before, how you train, all these different things. Um, so emanates throughout your life. Yeah. So I think something like American football, it's like, well, when we look at, and I'm sure there are people who are doing work to try to change this, but like when we look at what practices are sort of surrounding that, the external that's sort of brought in, how diverse is that? I think that's probably a valid question compared to maybe some other things that have been sort of maybe in conversation with a broader range of movement practices. I think those may be better positioned to carry on. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, football seems very, very profitable to me. So, uh, oh, I mean, it's definitely it's profitable, and it's, but it may be it seems like it's still attracting an extraordinary caliber of athlete as well. I mean, DK Metcalf, you know, right, went over to track and ran a ten thirty six, and he's six foot three and weighs two thirty five. Like, I'm pretty sure that that guy would be an extraordinary rugby player. He could probably play basketball at a high level. You know, if he came over to parkour, he would be absurd, right? You know, mm -hmm. decathlete, you think he wouldn't smash the decathlon? Right. I mean, I think there's still a good argument that the best athletes in the world play American football. I suppose it depends on the definition of athlete. But I think I see something like American football as being kind of strong in the sense of an iron block, right? I maybe don't see it as being uh anti-fragile so i think that's what it means like it looks big and strong and prominent as it is but my you know kind of using that evolutionary selective lens of diversity and degeneracy i would say from my person and again this is all speculation you know mm -hmm. um that it could be the kind of thing you know that could go out like the dinosaur sort of in sort of a big bust I mean, which we're kind of, we're seeing, like, it would have been hard to predict, um, you know, all this stuff with concussions and stuff, yeah. you know, and then you say, well, okay, now all of a sudden this is selection pressure that you have to adapt to. How yeah. easy is it now? And then it becomes very relevant for that sport movement practice. How do we adapt? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to, to take the head contacts out of, of American mm -hmm. football. But I also mm -hmm. think it's weird. Like I looked into it, like, you know, is rugby safer? Mm -hmm. 
that's no, <laughs> it's not. Yeah. Like there's a, you know, there's a, there's an argument that, that made sense to me that, that when you, when you put a helmet on the head, people use the head as a, as a weapon mm -hmm. and therefore it becomes more dangerous. Yeah. But the statistics don't back that up. All right. I, yeah. I think the I mean, concussion I... is actually higher in rugby. Um, so, so football is attracting a lot of the attention around CTE issues. Yeah. Um, but, uh, or sorry, CTI issues, but, um, but, but the same issues are actually also in well MMA for sure <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and rugby and even, uh, even soccer, right. Or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like all the heading of the ball, right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of micro trauma on the skull. Mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, we might see, a, 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 an issue. Now it seems to me that it'd be a lot easier to, to get rid of heading in soccer mm -hmm. And to adapt it such that that became a, a less prominent part of the game than to get rid mm -hmm. of, um, or to change the ball such that it was less traumatic to head, mm -hmm. right? Than to change football such that concussions truly become like a minor risk. Mm -hmm. so I can see that, um, but that's also a very specific stressor, right? Mm -hmm. Like, right? It might is. not. I mean, I just was using that sort of as an example of something that maybe would have been kind of harder to predict. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I should get off the, yeah. the call. This is quite a long, great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. thanks for, thanks for, for ringing me up and saying, let's talk. I do yeah, want to excellent. get more into, um, the motivational stuff from a, from an ecological psychologist perspective. And also, um, uh, I think there's something very interesting about what ecological psychology has to donate to these broader meaning questions that I'm, that yeah. I'm with. And there's something there, it feels like for me that that is a necessary piece in sort of articulating what I'm talking about, like what, what's happening with Ravaki, what's happening with Peterson, how yeah. that interacts with the embodiment movement and, you know, this kind of philosophical development of movement, movement cultures. Yeah. Um, um, and I can't quite explain it, but there's a way in which it seems like it scaffolds up to insights yeah. that we need, but it's still like we, you know, I talk about it in relationship to meaning, right? Well, what, what is the meaning of an, what it, like, I think the question of meaning in life in some way has to be, ha, comes through like scaffolding up from what is the meaning of a cup, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think ecological psychology is the place where we start to, or ecological dynamics is the place where we actually start to answer that question in an effective way. Yeah. But most of the people thinking about ecological psychology are still focused at the level of the meaning of the cup. It feels like to me, right? And aren't recognizing or aren't aren't trying to bridge that gap all the way up, right? I think what I like about it is it's like it's firmly realist. So it's a very realist ontology. I mean, yeah. um, Gibson's explicit about that. Obviously, you can have different people working within. You know, it's not like um, you've got to buy a certain set Real. of properties. But, you know, idealist. Yeah, or as opposed to like a constructivist, uh, subjective. So yeah. Gib Gibson's main, you know, this is his famous quote, this is don't ask what's inside your head, ask what your head is inside of, right? Yeah. So he's saying, you know, he's responding to whether it be cognitive psychology, the whole Cartesian, yeah. everything. It's sort inside. of anti-romanticism, right? Right, anti right. Right. He's um, saying that, you know, you know, like you saw that conversation between me and Verveke, I believe mm -hmm. Yeah, you're commenting on that. So, you know, he's tracking the problems with postmodernism back to nominalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is essentially the idea that, you know, it's the inversion of the Tao, right? It's mm -hmm. the idea that, that things take their form from being named and that nothing mm -hmm. precedes that active naming, that willful uh, kind of, uh, that willful, assertion into mm -hmm. you know existence of things right and then romanticism sort of puts puts everything in us being projected out mm -hmm. um so yes obviously gibson is is sort of the the antithesis of that mm -hmm. um but on a on a much more scientifically grounded realm, right right and that's 
that's what I like. Uh, you know, he challenges things like we were talking earlier with the time abstract and stuff. He challenges things for sure. Um, but he's, for me, he's very grounded. He's, uh, he's a realist. You know, he believes that what we see is a real feature of the world. It's not just something that occurs subjectively inside of my head. Yeah. Um, so I think that for me, I mean, obviously, there's always shortcomings in any need to and that's where i think so there's something about ecological psychology that also feels incomplete to me and mm -hmm. again like you know i said this in my conversation with viveki but like i don't know the literature well enough to really mm -hmm. make this critique necessarily mm -hmm. but like just i've run into a few things where it feels like you know people start using the idea of circular causality in a where where it feels like a a hand wave or a dog yeah Right. People use, I mean, nowadays people throw complexity or self-organization out just a lot of times. Yeah. So, someone just said to yeah, me, yeah. like, you know, emergence, people start to use the word emergence like magic. Right. And then magic happened and then this thing. Right. Right. Um, and and I, I think that you do have to ask what the head's inside of, but you also have to ask what's inside the head. Right. Like that's where like, I think evolutionary psychology comes in and it's useful because you can't couple uh -huh. to the environment without having motivation within. Yeah. Right. And what's that motivation? Like, why do we have specific motivational frames? Those things have been, have been, have, have evolved within us over time as we have adapted to environments. Right. And to me, that's what I, I think I like that river, river bed metaphor. Yeah. The river, so river different, bed. Different scales. Yeah. I, agree. Yeah. I agree. I think that that's perfect, right? Like we, we need to look at both of those questions, right? You, you can't, you can't do one without the other. Yeah. Right? Like you have to ask, okay, how, how is this organism coupling to the environment? Well, what is within the organism that, what is the needs, right? Like if we think about the cup, it's like, so we have effectivities of the body, right? Mm -hmm. Have the capacity to grasp. Mm -hmm. but I'm also, I'm also a, a former fish, <laughs> right? Right. That has to, has to maintain liquids that I lose easily. And right. So I have a strong motivation to find ways to move liquids into my body. Yeah. So asking what's outside of my body gives me a lot of information, but it doesn't give me all the information because you can only understand the meaning of the cup. Once you understand that it couples to, to a need that I have. And then when we add the evolutionary Darwinian frame, that really roots it deep because, because well, why do we need to drink, right? Right. Well, where, where did life arise? It arises in the ocean, right? Right. And we're these terrestrial animals, right? And we have this, we have this need to, to, to replenish fluids. Right? And as a human being, I have a special need to replenish fluids because I have the capacity to sweat, which, you know, Blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, I, I'm getting, I'm getting tangential about yeah. like, all the evolutionary aspects of human beings. But w sometimes when I read the ecological psychology research, it, it, it doesn't seem to be fully sort of integrated into the overall Darwinian project. Hmm. That's my it perception. It probably depends who you know. read. Um, I think the, the point that I would emphasize out of that is like, what Gibson's saying is like, what a cup is is just for you is functionally just what affords drinking you know in that instance right mm -hmm. um you know whether it be your hands or flower pot or whatever some concave object that you can put a substance yeah. in right yeah that's and i think that's where he starts to say well you know meanings coming out of that not so much out of classification right or a name of the object yeah but yeah. where where i see a rose by any other name would smell as sweet right a cup right. by any other name it's like it's not the right. naming of the cup right and and this right. is you know i think it's interesting that like i encountered gibson through peterson who's a mm -hmm. clinical personality psychologist and mm -hmm. verveke who's a um who's a 4e cognitive scientist right mm -hmm. and I, i'd love to know more about the relationship between 4e cog sci and ecological psychology as well because I'm, I'm curious what's going on there. Cause I, so, I it's, but, but 
Yeah. Like very, very, very quick sound bite on that is. Uh, and if if by any chance John happens to hear this, I mean no offense, because there's so many brilliant researchers who use the term uh, for you, but. Yeah. I think ecological people look at the term for e sort of the way when people say, yeah, I'm spiritual. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's quite vague. Um, obviously, John, someone of his caliber has got, you know, so many uh, research, you know, he's got a very distinct research project that he's working on that he's, he's using that as a sort of a way of reaching out to people. Um, but it, it tends, people sometimes criticize it's quite broad. It doesn't constrain. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion does come from. Because, you know, within people talking about embodiment, I mean, embodiment is a little bit one of those words that oh, yeah. people, they just use it to mean everything. It's like movement, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could go off on that. Um, yeah. But uh, that when I was talking to Dwart, he was like, he thinks that all the four E's are contained within ecological, the yeah. one that we call ecological, right? Um, yeah. Which I thought was, I, I don't know, I, I'd have to dig deeper to really understand it. But I do think that there's, that it's a really interesting conversation to have. But um, yeah. But I think, um, you know, we'll have to, we have to hold it to the next time. Yeah, let's do that. Rafe, I've enjoyed this a lot. Yeah, likewise, man. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, um, it's uh, well, since we're going to put this out, I think we're going to put this out because I think it's okay. Putting out, um, uh, big picture soccer on Twitter, anywhere else people should be finding your work. Um, yeah, blog is big picture soccer coaching.com. Um, you know, some stuff directly for practitioners. Hey, you reached the end of another Evolve Move Play podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, if you want to be involved in the conversation, please consider joining us in our new membership subscription so you can get access to question and answers with our live speakers once a month, question and answers with me once a month, and a dedicated forum to discuss everything going on in the podcast, as well as a general discussion of movement on our general movement forums. If you're interested in that, make sure to check out the link below get signed up and join a part of our membership community. If you can't join our membership community right now, it's still always helpful if you can like, share, and subscribe, and even hit that bell and get notifications for upcoming Evolve Move Play podcasts. But adios for now, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.